Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back my dear friends, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you wherever you are in this part of the globe. And as you know this is the, uh, the lecture series on investment analysis and portfolio management under the SWAM uh, lecture uh, discussions. And uh, we will be uh, completing the 29th lecture today and it was is basically a continuation of the 28th lecture because even though we have planned to finish uh, all the relevant discussions in the 28th one, but as the discussion continued, there were some spills, spillovers. So, in the last class, we did discuss about what is a Wiener process, what are the assumptions, how you can generate that, uh, a simple Wiener process. And considering what are the, uh, the main three bullet points of the assumptions which was there in the beginning of the 20th lecture. Then we moved on to generalized Wiener process. In the generalized Wiener process, there were two components, was one, one was the drift and one of the volatility. So, in the very simplistic case uh, for the Wiener process, um, it was considered that uh, the, the, the rate of change of delta z would be given by the multiplicative factor of the error term and an error, error term was basically normally distributed standard normal with 0 mean and 1 variance multiplied by that would be generated each in time and that would be multiplied by square root of uh, the delta t time. Delta t is basically the difference in the time. Then we considered that if the drift comes and the volatility comes, the, the variables or, or the multiplicative factor for A which is A and B for these two respective um, things which is the drift and the volatility were constant independent of, of X and T. Act, actually X is basically the stock price which is the random variable. Later on we saw that um, and it was mentioned that the volatility would depend based on what the prices were at the beginning when you started doing the calculations. We had also planned uh, which we will do today is basically discuss about the ITO process, ITO's lemma, the corresponding discussions about how ITO process can be utilized to find out the Black-Scholes model and what are the assumptions for the Black-Scholes model which is basically the, the main uh, very simplistic and but main uh, formula for calculating the option pricing. So, this is the 29th lecture, I have already mentioned that. So, generally the last uh, class was the Wiener, main discussions were to be uh, under Wiener process and Ito's lemma, we will continue that. The discussions which we have already done on the de lecture descriptions, the main bullet points, we will try to do is basically Monte Carlo simulation, the Ito's lemma, the Taylor series expansion, how it can be utilized, um, giving logic that how we can derive the formula and finally, the assumptions of Black-Scholes model and the final formula for the same. Now, if you remember, um, we were discussing time and again and I did mention that depending on the continuous um, compounding interest rate and the distribution of the stock prices, um, we can, we know that the rate of change of the so, so, rate of change of basically the stock price with respect to its initial value. So, here when you see this S is basically the stock price depending on from where you are have started your counting your process or trying to basically do the formulation and that is distributed with um, as, as normal with a mean value of mu into delta t and variance as sigma square into delta t. So, delta t is basically the time difference and 
in the actual formula this mu is basically if you compare with the generalized Wiener process this mu was basically the factor A. Obviously, there would be other terms also, but main thing being the drift which you are interested to understand the drift and this basically being the factor B which is basically related to the vol vol volatility. And this delta, let me use a different color, it will be easy. So, delta T was basically the important point which we mentioned that the variance is additive and the standard deviation is dependent on the square root of delta T. So, as you go further down from, from the point at T is equal to 0, the overall variance explodes. That's, that means, uh, if we look at the diagram of how you want to find out the variances, it basically increases. So, obviously, there would be a fluctuation here uh, for the stock prices, but it increases. So, we can sample random paths and, and all this, this diagram which I just drew in the last slide in the slide number 5 was basically a snapshot of one set of realized values. So, if you continue taking a snapshot um, at each and every point and depending on how the prices are fluctuating, you can basically find out is it is fluctuating randomly, but with the underlying assumption that the expected value and the variances have certain values which you have already written down and discussed time and again in the last class also and just a uh, few seconds back. So, we can sample the random paths for the stock price by sampling values from the error term. So, this error term we know has a particular distribution and based on the based on the fact that we have discussed that uh, when we are discussing about the winner process. So, suppose the drift or the mu value is 0.14 the standard deviation is 0.2 and the time difference delta t uh, or del t whatever it is written here and I did mention that delta t, del t, dt uh, for, for this course I am just going to use them interchangeably without going to the mathematical details. So, as per the formula you had del s by s is normally distributed with mean and, and a variance of this. So, if I want to generate it and considering the factor, so delta s would basically have two terms. Term 1 is the drift. So, I am taking s onto the right hand side. So, actually it is s naught from where I am measuring and if I consider the volatility, so this is the volatility. The term which is basically 0 0.02 which is coming from the fact that is the standard deviation multiplied by s will give you that factor of b. And if you remember, initially B was considered to be constant. Now, then we consider this is a function of x and delta t or t consider it as t. And similarly, for the case of A, so this is basically the A term which can be constant or it can be dependent on x and t. And here x is the spot price or the price of the stock. Now, in this whole formula, if you see, so let me, so in this whole formula which you consider, everything is known apart from the epsilon. And now epsilon obviously you can generate. So, if I consider delta s, it is equal to s1 minus s naught 
and this 1 and not are the time frames such that t1 minus t not is equal to the delta t which we are considering so that is known we have decided and we are told that is equal to 0 0.01 with whatever the units are this price of s which you have this one this s or this s is basically the initial price which is basically s not once it is known you generate the first realized value epsilon considering the distribution which we have discussed many times the standard normal deviate that value is is found out and obviously that delta s can be either or del s can be the positive or negative depending on what the value of epsilon is so once del s is is known you can find out so I'll, you can find out s1 as equal to s0 which is known plus del s so this is known this is known the factor first which is not known we find it out in the next stage second stage again we find out s2 is equal to s1 plus del s so del s is basically now the difference between the price of s1 and s2 again we generate a standard normal deviate and proceed accordingly and remembering here this s which you have considered is the price based on which where we are starting so that will keep changing depending on the initial value of the stock price which we have so let us consider a uh, uh, theoretical um, value where in the first column you have the period time periods so they are given as t is equal to 0 then 1 2 3 4 and the difference between t0 t1 t1 t2 are fixed which as per the formula was was given as delta t the stock price initially which based on which we will start the the simulation which is the Monte Carlo simulation 1 is 20 and the only factor which we need to generate if you remember again I am mentioning is epsilon and this epsilon values are generated at each step so it is 0.52 so based on that family uh, the values you first find out delta s which which would come out to be the factors which you already considered the factors means the values which we have already 0 0.14 0 0.2 and 0 0.01 so if I consider this so consider the first one delta s which is here and, I need, and I need to find out this is equal to mu as I will keep shifting from slide uh, 7 to 6 so please bear so is equal, is, is equal to given by the values of uh, based on the normal distribution so is equal to 0 0.014 into s so this is 0 0.0014 into s is 20 plus this uh, value of, of um, standard deviation is given as 0 0.02 0 0.02 into s which is 20 into epsilon which is 0 0.54 so if you put these values you would be getting so let us consider bring um, the fact of the discussion so let me discard it and and open the excel sheet i'll copy these values and and then make a comparison for the values being calculated based on the fact that whatever calculations we did matches the table so let me zoom in so bet for better view so we have the time period t so 0 1 2 3 4 5 and so on and so forth 
now we have initially s value so it is given by 20 that is fixed so let i have to basically highlight it for ease of understanding for all of us so this is fixed then we have the epsilon values and they would be generated be depending on the standard normal deviation i'll come to that later on and then is the delta s so delta s formula so now i need to generate from the standard normal deviate let me check So, I need uh, to have weight standard. Let me see the standard. So, I think this would norm dot s dot distribution. So, z value uh, it is it is not there. So, wait let me check whether I have, but the values uh, which we will generate may not match the exact values which is shown in the table because they are a realized value for each and every generation which I consider. Standard returns the standard normal cumulative distribution. I do not need it. Returns the inverse of the standard normal. Wait, let me check. S dot distribution with zero. So, that would be given by cumulative. STD, yes, with calculus standard division. I am sorry it is taking a little bit long, but I will try to resolve it, if not proceed accordingly as so Anyway, I will I'll, I'll just I'll try to um, uh, do that in the last class. So, please bear with me. Anyway, coming back to this, uh, this um, standard normal deviate. So, once you have this, you, you generate from so the first value which you are generating, the value which I wrote, this point 5 2 is being generated from 0 1. So, once it is generated you which will give you the value of delta s, delta s is here and this value would be generated from and given this value. 
once you generate you have that formula which is mu into s plus sigma into s into the value of epsilon which is there which, which is as given in this formula and the value of mu and sigma are known to you based on that once you generate you find out delta s is 0 0.236 now this 0 0.236 is actually s1 minus s0 s0 is known so based on that i find out s1 for which now i'll use the color green so this s1 is is green and which is found out goes here so once this is done next stage again i generate these values so this i am going for the next step so this next step values are as follows so we have used the green color so we will stick to the green one in order to make uh, things simple for us so now we come to the t is equal to 1 epsilon is generated again n 0 1 that gives us 1.44 one this is known delta s is given by mu mu is already given to us is s plus the value of sigma into s into epsilon epsilon we have already generated this value of s has already been generated known to us so there this delta s is given here and now s2 minus s1 s1 is this value would give you give us s2 s2 now i'll use this different color s2 is here so basically s2 would be calculated accordingly so if you check 20 in the first case 20 plus 0.236 was 20.236 20 plus uh, 20.236 plus 0.611 comes out to be the value of 20.847 then in the next stage which is time period 2 for which we we'll, we are continuing to use the different color which is blue which is time period 2 epsilon is generated n 0 1 this value comes here so now see it's as it is generated it is a realized value which is negative then delta s is equal so this value has to be found out this is negative because the the second term is higher than the first term what is the second term and the first term are these oh sorry epsilon so this is the first term and this is the second term and there their epsilon is given by by point minus point eight six so once this is done your value would be now s3 minus s2 is equal to delta s delta s is this one s2 is already known which is 20 point eight four seven and the value of s3 now is given by this so keep generating and then you basically find out in the next step i'm going i slow that in order to uh, think make things a little bit more illustrative so in the last step
the values known were we want to do it for um, this third one so it is given epsilon is second last step normal 0 1 this value is given by plus point 1.46 delta s is equal to mu this mu value has been kept fixed it can change I wanted to highlight that uh, during the discussion. So, it can change depending on, on the drift values and, and how things are with the rate of change is kept fixed or changing. This s is also changing depending on each step which you proceed. This epsilon is basically the value which you have here. Now, that delta s is now here. 0.628 and you have f s4 minus s3 s3 is given here and s4 would be found out from here wait let me check let me check let me check so it's 20.847 minus 0 0.329 is 20.518 and then we when we add up 20 plus 5.518 plus 0 0.628 it comes out to be 21.46 this is the value which will come out here and we proceed accordingly and then find out so if i plot these values actually this is okay i should be utilizing a different color my apologies because color scheme we have tried to follow in order to make things a little bit more clear. So, if I plot these values this they would be given by the the how the stock prices are fluctuating and if I generate for time period 0 1 2 3 4 again I will get different values. So, these are the snapshots of the of the samples of the realized values which I am getting. So, which we plot it and depending on the random sampling which you are generating you can get different values accordingly. So, if we know the stochastic process as is, is followed by x. So, the Ito lemma tells us that the stochastic process followed is there is a function of g x t and, and, and we will be considering the function g x t where x is basically the, the random variable and t is the time and we later see that how we can utilize that and that stock prices s as the random variable to calculate and find out the Ito's lemma's uh, concept. Utilize that in Ito's lemma's concept and proceed further to find out the Black Schultz model. Since a derivative security is a function of the prices, so if you remember when you were discussing about the derivatives, the forwards and the options, so I did mention that you have an underlying asset, financial asset, and there was an uh, and based on that financial asset, you had a derivative. Uh, derived product. So, that uh, financial um, asset can be uh, either the stock market, can be the commodities and all, all the different things can be there. Since the derivative security is a function of the price of the underlying and the time, so Ito's lemma plays an important part in analysis of the derivative securities and trying to find out their prices. Now, we know a Taylor series expansion. So, a Taylor series expansion we know for uh, uh, univariate case for the multivariate case depending on the number of variables are more than one for the second case and we will be utilizing that uh, later on. So, here we have two variables one is x one is t. So, if you if you can recollect the the single variable Taylor series expansion it was basically uh, depending on the rate of change of that functional value and you took the first derivative, second derivative, third derivative and basically expanded that to find out the old series. Now, that was basically on the left hand side you had, you had the differences of the functional value that is f x 1 minus f x naught. Here x is not, I am not talking about the x which is being um, written down and which you have been discussing about uh, for the last two or three classes. X is just a, a variable uh, which we consider in the Taylor series expansion. 
So, if you have uh, the difference between the functional values based on the expansion that you are doing at x naught. So, the terms goes and if I consider the first second terms and accordingly it goes like this. The first set of terms considering it is a single variable would be this one. Why there are two terms here? Because there are two variables x and t. So, I find out the partial derivative of that function on g with respect to x and and then find out the partial derivative change of the function g with respect to t. So, this is the first part. In the second part, we have to find out d 2 f d x 2. So, now in case of x again there are two uh, variables here which is x and t. And, and that is basically divided d 2 f d x 2 is, is uh, multiplied by 1 by 2 factorial. So, that would be given by these set of terms. So, once is which is basically del 2 g del x 2, then you have basically a del 2 g del x del t and the third term is basically del 2 g del t 2. If I go corresponding to the third term, so there would be correspondingly first term would be, so obviously 1 by 3 would be coming here uh, on the factorial and, and if, you, if you see why there is not 1 by 2 here because it is, it, you can basically find out del 2 g del x del t and another case being del 2 g del t del x. So, it is twice and we consider it is a continuous one function. So, obviously, that twice is cancelled with half. So, without going to the details of the third term which we are ignoring because that uh, precision of pricing is not required. So, you will basically have del 3 del x 3 then you will have del 3 del x 2 del t then you will have I am highlighting the partial derivatives del 3 del x del t square then you have basically del 3 I am not writing all the terms but these were the important terms and obviously a factorial of 1 by factorial 3 would be coming for each term. So, if you can expand you can find out the corresponding series, series. Now, in ordinary calculus as we are discussing, so here um, we would basically have the functional values as given here. So, this, but in the stochastic sense and uh, stochastic calculus this would become the corresponding factor depending on how you can find out uh, the expansion. And here remember del t is basically the corresponding factor depending on the difference in the time. So, you can expand it for the higher terms, but we are going to ignore it as we said that in the last slide which was the ninth one. Now, come back to the original equation we have considered which was basically the generalized linear process. Why I am talk, telling about the generalized linear process? Because if you see there are two terms, one was basically the drift and here the drift we are considering A is a function of x and t and the second term was basically the volatility where again the, the variable B was dependent on x and t and this dz del t is basically a difference time, dz is basically the, the simple Wiener process. Now, once we, we write it down, so a now becomes a x t is basically now we are considering as a constant because if in the last problem we took as mu. So, a into del t and b uh, was basically the factor which is coming when we found out and a obviously would have the factor multiplied by s also because the actual formula was del s by s and this 
concept of basically b is basic uh, the standard deviation and multiplied by the s so thus ignoring the hi higher orders that means third and higher orders so our actual formula now becomes this one and that will be more than sufficient to do the calculation but obviously you have to find out the partial derivative of the functional form based on the how the function looks like now we already know epsilon is basically based on the standard normal deviate the expected word epsilon the error is zero and we know the corresponding variances uh, as per the assumptions we have already done so we we follows that the expected value of epsilon square into delta t would be given by delta t and, and as you go more away from uh, the time period t is equal to zero it will increase so the variance of delta t is proportional to basically the factors which are given and delta square and can be ignored so we are ignoring the higher terms and we'll only consider the corresponding factors why we are ignoring the de delta t square because delta t is actually very small so if you repeat it twice different di differentiate it twice the actual value becomes very small so that is negligible so only the rate of change of that functional form with the rate of change of the stock price which is s is important so first one which is important is the rate of change with respect to the stock price x second is the rate of change of that function with respect to time t and the third one being being with the rate of change the second derivative uh, with rate of change with um, x square and here del t rate of change is also ignored again because the rate the infinite decimal small time period would not have any factors to give a significant value uh, to the calculation so the other terms which are with respect to del t ignored del t square ignored so if you take the limits and do the substitution considering uh, dx is equal to a dt plus b dz the actual just simple substitutions once we do in this in this formulas so when you take the limits limits means the higher orders are ignored and we when we find out the actual formula which is the ito's lemma is given by this so here if you if you consider the the terms a is corresponding to the uh, drift and b is corresponding to the volatility z is basically the general winner process x is the time at which we are starting t um, x is the price and t is the time <clears throat> now coming back to the so I, I was talking x and s interchangeably when we replace that uh, for the s1 s means the stock price into the functional form so x is now s and time remains as it is the functional form of of the g based on which we want to find out how the prices of the actually the options would change depending on the prices of the stock which is the underlying stock would be this so if you consider here a which i have been talking about actually it is something to do, do with the drift multiplied by the actual spot at that point of time here the corresponding volatility will be coming out from two factors one is corresponding to the variance so that was basically if you consider b it was coming out with the calculation of of sigma into s
and based on that calculations you can find out. So, I am highlighting the main uh, concepts which are related to the drift and the volatility. Now, the forward price of a stock depending for a contract uh, we at any point of time we already know we already know the formula which is this we already know that whenever you are considering for the European uh, case it was given by S naught e to the power R t. So, R was the risk free interest rate. So, the forward price of a stock for a contract maturing at capital time t is equal to capital T at any point of time would be given by t minus small t where you are. So, when you mature you have reached the time period capital T. So, that will depend on the time frame and we can find out the derivative of g and then calculate and find out the corresponding value of dg which is the change of the value of the function g based on which you will find out the, the option pricing. Now, if we have the prices uh, as uh, log normal logarithmic value based on which you can find out the functional g replace that. and you get the functional form given as mu minus sigma square by 2 d t into sigma into d z. So, I am just replacing that in the values as required and we get the functional form of the function g based on the stock prices are distributed with logarithmic values. Now, as we have already done that as del s by s that means rate change of the prices of the spot depending on what is the spot price now. We already know that was given by the drift multiplied by the change in time plus the volatility factor drift means I am talking about a term the volatility factor which was basically the, the b term multiplied by delta z and z again the Weiner process. So, hence we can write down this z is basically we are trying to this s or delta s we are trying to find out the change in the spot based on the fact that it is to be calculated based on the logarithmic prices. So, once we put it here, so we consider the stock prices, the stock prices are log normally distributed. Thus, we find out del, del s and based on that we can find out the distribution of the prices. So, logarithmic of the prices would be given as normal with the mean value of so where we are starting if you remember it was mentioned that where we start would not have an effect on how the prices would be fluctuating. So, that would be given by um, log S naught plus S naught is the prices as of today mean to mu is this the, the uh, mean value and how mean value and sigmas are, are calculated I will come to that multiplied by the time factor and the variance is given by sigma square into t. So, t is a deciding factor which will basically dictate the how the prices fluctuate. Now, what are the assumptions on the black Scholes model which is important? So, I will I'll have written it and explain it briefly as possible. Point 1, the stock pays no dividend during the options life which we can't a zero coupon paying one because if, if those coupons are being paid then trying to find out that s value which you have taken here, this s value I will highlight with blue, this s value would change because the present value of all the in incremental um, uh, incomes which has been paid at some different point of time whether 6 months, 1 month, 3 months whatever they should be calculated. So, 
actually this s not act should be this i not is basically the present value of all the coupons being paid so we are considering that is not there so most companies pay dividend to the shareholders a common way of adjusting the model for this situation is to subtract the discounted value which i just told you but initially we will consider there is no dividend paying one we will also consider the time to expiration based on which the option can be exercised is at maturity so we would not be considering any american options so european excise terms are used so european excise term dictates that the option can only be exercised on the expiration date which we have considered american excise terms allow the options to be exercised at any point of time so this limitation is not a major concern because very few calls are ever exercised before the last day so everybody waits till they exercise that option so this is true because when we exercise a call early you forfeit the remaining time value of the call which may have been positive for your decision which you have not taken we'll consider the third one the markets are efficient so which means that all the information which is available with the buyer and seller is uniform so nobody has any any extra sets of in, in, set of in, in, uh, information about the prices so this assumption suggests that the people cannot consistently predict the direction of the movement of the prices of an, any individual stock so i can predict if i have extra information but that information is available everywhere the market operates continuously with the share prices following a continuous eto process to understand what a continuous eto process is you may first know that the markov process is one where the observation in time period t depends only on the preceding observation so everybody has that nobody has any extra information so whatever we all predict are the same so everybody would act accordingly an eto process is simply a markov process in continuous time so if you if you draw the continuous process is that like you are drawing random lines without picking up the pen so it's like this which we have done that but i still highlight it so here so the prices are moving so continuously they are moving and if you can remember they were considered a continuous variable continuous time and the next instant when i again consider another price it would be like this which i have drawn i remember when we are talking about the expected value of st is equal to s not into e to the power rt that means whatever has happened and based on what you are going to predict would basically be the expected value of st st means the price of the stock at time t is equal to capital t so no commissions are charged so that means usually market participants do not have to pay any commission to buy or sell because if that comes that will basically have an adverse effect on the on the, um, the calculations because we consider that buying and selling the stocks are are without any brokerage costs so even the flow traders pay some kind of fee but it is usually very small so we'll ignore that that fees that individual in investors pay is more substantial and can often distort the output of the model and give answers which are not exactly equal to what the prices should be we'll also consider the interest rate remains constant and known so this is the interest rate what i'm talking about is basically the risk free interest rate rf and if you consider we had mentioned that the uh, this uh, interest rate uh, rf actually i did mention time and again it is not fixed so it is considered t bills of 91 days treasury bills for 91 days but we'll consider that to be fixed for the whole time period even though it's fluctuating depending on the demand and supply so interest rate remains constant and known the black scholes model uses the risk free interest rate which is rf capital rf or small rf uh, whatever it is rate of return or that kind of consideration which you have done in reality there is no such thing as risk free rate but the discount rate on government treasury bills with 30 days left until maturity is usually used to represent it and do the calculations during periods of rapidly changing interest rate these 30 day interest rate are often subject to change thereby violating one of the assumptions of the model the other final one is this assumption suggest which is returns are log normally distributed this is assumption suggest returns on the underlying stocks are normally distributed which is reasonable 
log normal distribute it is reasonable to consider that most of the assets basically which have an option have that price distribution as I have given. So, there are six main assumptions I will I'll, I'll, I'll repeat stock pays no dividend I naught is not there. We consider the option till expiration date European one. Markets are efficient that means, everybody has the same set of informations and the past data one, one uh, step backward data is available to all because the past does not have any effect on, on the future until unless we are only standing at time t is equal to 1 and have all the information based on which the prices was at t is equal to 0, the incremental time whatever it is. We will consider no commission charges no taxations and all these things would be there. I did not mention about the tax concept, but we would consider it is not there. The fifth one means the interest rate RF which we are going to consider is fixed even though that is not true in practical sense and returns would be considered as long normally distributed. So, once we have the based on the ETO process and the assumptions of function G and which is dependent on x and t and considering the drift and the volatility, the final Black Scholes model is this a stochastic partial differentiation where the terms are this. This value of small f is basically the value of the forward contract which is important for us to find out. S is basically the stock prices as of today. So, it would be technically known to us. The risk free interest rate I am I am reading the assumption and the main variables. So, risk free interest rate R f is known to us. The time capital where we are standing is known to us and the volatility of the underlying asset which is the most important thing based on which all the calculations would be done is basically the volatility of the corresponding stock which we are trying to find out would also be known to us based on the assumptions. S is known and here S is also known, RF is known. So, what is important to find out in this equation is F. So, this is the um, uh, so stochastic um, partial differentiation equation based on which we need to find out. So, volatility of the underlying asset, the model describes the evolution of the prices of the option over time as a function of time and the value of the underlying which is there, underlying asset. The assumption of normality is very important as it leads to the under underpricing in non-Gaussian situation. So, Gaussian situation means the, the bell shaped curve which you have based on the normality of the assumption and they must be used. Uh, cautiously, but still the um, black Schultz model give us good pricing based on which many calculations can be done. It is like this in a very simple way. We consider that friction in the theoretical sense friction is not there, but still we use the simplistic assumptions uh, based on, on Newton's law and do all the calculation which has give us very good results like the first law, the second law or the the, the equations of motions whatever I am talking from the uh, physics point of view. Similarly, when a pendulum is, is there is a simple hummock motion, we can again consider there is no friction, uh, no loss of energy. Still we utilize the formulas which give us good result in comparison to the practical sense. So, method of calculating the put and the call can be checked using the good financial calculator. An example you can it is replete with all the examples in the market as, as required. So, uh, with this I will end the 29th lecture and we will consider uh, the other discussions um, in the last uh, lecture which is the 30th one for this whole series and we will discuss try to wrap up and give a overall view also in the 30th lecture as required. Have a nice day and thank you very much.